this morning that as the uh, wise men and the shepherds came that morning to uh, honor and adore Jesus, it says, well, that's what we came here this morning to do as well. Amen. It's good to see all of you here today. Uh, we had a great time at the Christmas parade last night in Searcy. All of us came out and we uh, and we did our little Mount Pisky float. And, uh, the angels, if they would have just been a little more dressed up and got a little more attention, it would have been better. But, you know, yeah. you know, they, they actually, the angels stole the show last night. And then we had a good time. Um, in the way of announcements, uh, tonight will be the Lord's Supper. This is the first Sunday of the quarter, so we'll be doing the Lord's Supper tonight. Remember that. Next Sunday night uh, would, would have been our scheduled potluck Sunday, but we're not having potluck that day, but we're still omitting the night service for that night. So there'll be no night service next Sunday night. Remember that. Is there any other announcements that I may have missed? When are we going to do our business meeting for December if we're doing Lord's Supper tonight and then no Sunday? Well, that's what we mentioned last Sunday. We're just going to have to try to fit it in as we can somehow. Because oh, we didn't, we didn't well, I, didn't, I wasn't here because the kids were sick, yeah. so I wasn't sure. We'll have to just, uh, maybe one of these Sundays after the service, we can okay. do that in. Yeah, that's what they said. If Alana had been here, we would have scheduled it. But... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Any other announcements? The nursing home saying that you might want to tell that's right. Okay, we are going to have the nursing home singing. Help me out here on the date. 15th, I think. The 16th? 15th. 15th? 15th. I'm here too. 15th. 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 <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. We're going to have the nursing home singing on the 15th of this month. It'll be, uh, that'll be a Saturday night, correct? Correct. And we'll be meeting around 5 o'clock. We're going to sing it. Um, the Crossing and Oakdale Nursing Home on that night. So as many of you can come and be with us, guitar players, singers, whoever, we need you. We need your help. You might want to mention what we're going to do afterwards. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you think that might cause more people to come? Well, you ain't going to hurt nothing. <laughs> all right, then. well, what we're going to do afterwards is we're going to all go out to eat. How many of y'all like to eat? <laughs> all right, we're all going to go out to eat after the service. It'll be getting right around good lunchtime after we get done singing. It doesn't take as long to go through there and sing. So come be with us. Not only just for the eating part, we're just joking about that, but uh, it's, it's good to be a blessing to these old folks who can't get out. And they a lot of them don't even see their family anymore. They've just been neglected there, and they really enjoy it whenever we come and uh, sing these good old Christmas songs to them. We will be doing this as a church group, going eating after the singing, and the church is going to pay the bill for everybody's food. Right, right. So no one will be out that night. The church is going to take care of all eats. So come be with us. You have no excuse now. So everybody's going to leave the crossing. The crossing first, the final park. <laughs> after the crossing, we'll go to Oakdale, and after that, we're going to go leave. All right. Anything else needs to be mentioned? If not, let's go ahead and start with a prayer request then. Spoken. Remember the corporate plan out of all of them lost a cousin. All right. Anyone else? Continue to remember Cameron Allen. She's been dealing with migraines for 
almost solid for a couple of weeks now. And temperature that keeps going up really high and they can't find the cause of it. So she's back in the hospital again. Anyone else? Remember Shirley's sister. She's really bad. Good, thanks. Remember me. Also, um, my friend Ashley volunteers at the Camp Quality there in Ball Nog. That is the summer camp that they do every year for uh, children who have cancer and their siblings. That way they're able to be able to do it. There is a little girl who's, I believe, three or four. Her name is Lily that has pretty severe cancer that she's shared about. And I believe they said she was getting sent home to the hospital with hospice care. So it doesn't look real good for her. Um, we need to remember uh, Brother Lane and his family. We need to remember uh, Sammy and Winnie. We need to remember Jimmy and Rhonda and her mother. Anyone else? Sick to her stomach this morning. And my brother Jim West, who uh, Jason Lockhart's father-in-law passed away too tonight. They buried him yesterday. He passed every day from Desert for 30 years and was chaplain at the Prairie County Jail. <coughs> my heart on that church and family. Let's remember all of them. Anyone else? Anyone? All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer and lift up all these who've been mentioned. Brother uh, Scott, would you lead us, please, sir?
I know that was too good. I'll play my main glass.
that one, I'll eat two. So I won't be off next time, so we're gonna do it in D. D chord. Yeah. Would it be hard to go to C? You just play in C. What what you do? Ain't no thing for her. She'll just move up a fret. We'll do C. Okay. It might be easier to sing this morning to C. Mm -hmm. That's me. <clears throat> Would be easier to do You don't C. care if it's easy for me. <laughs> just take me for granted. <laughs> Thanksgiving holiday, I decided to go a little different direction with our service, and uh, so we postponed this for a little bit. We're going to finish it today. We begin to talk about the subject of making dangerous decisions. Dangerous decisions, and we we looked here at the story of a man by the name of Lot. Look with me, if you would, beginning uh, in chapter uh, 13 and verse 10. 
It says, And Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere, before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt. And thou comest unto Zoar. Then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves the one from the other. Abram dwelled in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent toward Sodom. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. Now, let me just go back and review what we've already talked about. We had this issue here with uh, Abram, who would later become Abraham, and his nephew Lot. They were both herdsmen. They, had, uh, they were very wealthy. They had lots of uh, herds and uh, flocks. And their cattlemen began to fight amongst each other, and they had to separate. And Abraham told Lot, he said, pick, pitch, uh, pick whichever direction you want to go. If you go east, I'll go west. If you go north, I'll go south. And the Bible tells us that Lot, in verse 11, chose him, and that means he chose for himself. And that's a dangerous decision right there, to choose anything for yourself. But he chose him all the plain of Jordan. Lot looked and he saw all of that beautiful grass, and he thought about how that good that would be for his flocks and his herd, and how material-wise it would be a better choice for him to go in that direction, even though the city of Sodom and Gomorrah was in that direction, a wicked city. He made this decision without God. He made it not thinking about God, not thinking about his family, but only thinking about himself. And it was a terrible decision. The first point we talked about was this choice that Lot made. And not only... Uh, this choice, but we talked about Lot's character, and all of this, all this bad choice did was just reveal the weakness of Lot's character. It showed exactly how spiritually weak that he was. Now we're not going to to uh, go much more into that. We'll just go right on into our third point. But the third thing that I want you to see is not only Lot's choice, and not only Lot's character that revealed his choice, but I want you to see Lot's calamity, Lot's calamity that came as a result of his choice. Now, at the first, there didn't seem to be any calamity. Amen? Thank you, brother. And, and I would imagine that if we'd come to uh, come up to him and seen Lot back then, we would have probably thought, well, hey, boy, Lot, you are a very successful man. Things look like they're going well for you. Here you are a councilman here in, in Sodom, and, and you're living in a nice home. You have a good family. Your daughters are married to some of the leading citizens here in Sodom. Hey, Lot, what a success you are. You've got money in Sodom First National Bank. You, uh, you, uh, you're a member of that liberal first church in Sodom Heights. Probably hobnob and drank cocktails with the pastor of that church. Oh, Lot, he's just doing real well. His children may have been voted the most likely to succeed in their high school because, after all, their father was so very successful. There he is sitting in the gate. He looks so prosperous. He looks so successful. But in the eyes of God, he is a colossal failure. I want to read you something. I want you to turn to Genesis chapter 19 if you would. I'm almost embarrassed to read it. But I want to read it to you. Now, it's not that I'm embarrassed to read the Word of God, but I'm embarrassed of uh, the story that this man has of how he failed God. I want you to notice that God is so fed up with Sodom and Gomorrah and the way that they lived was a stink. It was a stench in the nostrils of God. And, and God sent two angels to warn Lot to flee from that city. And when these two angels came to warn Lot, now they, they appeared as men. And all of these sexual perverts in Sodom saw them and they wanted to commit their filthy abominations upon these two visitors from heaven. And Lot, he's a little embarrassed by it. He's brought the, the angels into his house and, and these perverts are banging on the door with their perverted, filthy lust and they're, they're, they're banging on the door saying, Let us in! And here Lot is on the inside and I want you to listen to what this pussyfooter of a Christian has to say. In verse 17, I'm sorry, verse 7 of, of chapter 19. And said, I pray you, brethren, do not so wickedly. Did you, did you hear that? What's going on? And, and Lot goes inside and then he, he hollers back out to them, Oh, brethren, please, do not so wickedly. Don't do this. 
First of all, he's calling these filthy Sodomites his brothers. And then, and then look, he says, he says uh, and, and say, I pray you, brethren, do not so wickedly. Behold, now I have two daughters which have not known man. Let me, I pray you, bring them out unto you, and do you to them as is good in your eyes. That is, he was going to sacrifice his two virgin daughters upon the altar of their filthy lust. Behold, now I have two daughters which have not known man. Let me, uh, I pray you, bring them out unto you, and do you unto them as is good in your eyes. Only unto these men do nothing, for therefore came they under the shadow of my roof. And they said, Stand back. And they said again, This one fellow came in to sojourn, and he wills need be a judge. Now will he deal worse, will we deal worse with thee than with them? And they pressed sore upon the upon the man, even Lot, and came near to break the door. Now, I'm not going to tell you any more of the story. I'm sure most of you have read it many times. But what a tragedy this was. And I told you at the beginning of the message that uh, it would be hard for you to believe if you didn't know any better that this man was even a saved man, that he even knew God. But he was saved. The Bible says he was saved. And, and uh, what happened here? He had became so much a part of Sodom, he had sunk so low in sin, he had made some decisions so wrongly that now he has lost the ability to even make decisions rightly. Right. His mind is warped and twisted by sin. You ask, now how could this happen? Folks, I'm going to tell you what. It can happen. It can happen to anybody. And here's a man who, in my opinion, has reached the ultimate low by offering his two virgin girls to these perverted Sodomites. How could this have happened? I want to tell you something and you listen to me. Sin will warp your mind. It will warp your mind. I don't care if you are a Christian. It will warp your mind. I told you this before. I'll tell you again. There are three people sitting in that pew in that spot that you occupy. There is a person that you are right now. Secondly, there is a person that you could be if you sold out to Jesus 100%. Very few of us ever do that. And oh, what a revival we would have in this world if all of us would sell out for Jesus 100%. But thirdly, there is a person sitting in that pew right there where you are, the person for evil that you could become if you turn your eyes away from God and you get out of His will and you drift into sin. I don't think that there's anybody here today that really, truly understands the person that you could be for evil. But I'm telling you, there's a person that you could be for evil. The things that you are capable of doing, you probably don't even understand that the person you are capable of being, that evil is down in all of our hearts, folks. All of our hearts. You say, no, not me, Brother Russell. I know I, now, since I've become a Christian, I have matured. Let me tell you something. Don't you fool yourself for one minute. That which is flesh is flesh, and you are still in the flesh. Right. And as long as you're in the flesh, you are capable of anything. You take your eyes off the Lord, you start making bad decisions. Just a bunch of small decisions stacked up and it will amaze you what you could be or what you could become or what you could do. I was reading about a man in the Old Testament by the name of Doeg. I think that's how you pronounce his name. And it was prophesied of him that he would commit certain terrible sins. I mean sins like, the Bible said, like ripping open pregnant women. Terrible things like that. And you know what Doeg said? He said, am I a dog that I would do such a thing? Am I a dog that I would do anything like that? I wouldn't do anything like that. But you know what? He did. He did, just as the Bible prophesied. He had no idea of the vile, the uh, potential of sin that was within him. I'm going to tell you, you have no idea either how low you could go. And I'm talking to you, Mr. Preacher. I'm talking to you, Mr. Deacon. I'm talking to you, Mr. and Miss Sunday School Teacher, Miss Goody Two Shoes, that sugar wouldn't melt in your mouth. I'm telling you, there are three people sitting in that seat. And one of them is the person of evil that you could become if you take your eyes off of the Lord. And I'm telling you, there is no limit to the vileness and sin which you could sink. David was a man after God's own heart, but look at the vileness that got into David's heart. That's the reason, folks, the Bible says, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. And I'm amazed that the Bible calls this man over and over in the New Testament a, a man who'd been justified, a man who'd been saved, but he was. And what a horrible story uh, this was. He had lost the ability to see the difference between right and wrong. You know, that seems to be a common thing today. 
Let me read to you something that a leader of a correctional school for boys said. He said, one of the great problems that we have in this school is the boys that come to this school have absolutely no concept of right and wrong. Folks, we have an entire generation like that today. Amen. We have people that live all around us. They have no concept of right or wrong. Sin had so warped the mind of this man Lot. And now, God begins to send judgment. Look at verse 24. Chapter 19, verse 24 and 25. I won't read the whole story, but listen to this. Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. Now, if you're wondering how God feels about uh, sexual perversion, folks, just read the story. God left Sodom and Gomorrah in his smoking ruins to show how he feels about this. And that is an example for all of us to follow and learn from from that day forward. But we're not listening to it, are we? Look at verse 25. And he overthrew those cities and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the city and that which grew upon the ground. Now look in verse uh, 26. But his wife looked back from behind and she became a pillar of salt. Now skip down to verse 35. Now this verse talks about his two daughters here. And they made their father drink wine that night also and the younger arose and lay with him and he perceived not when she lay down, nor when she arose. Thus were both the daughters of Lot with child by their father. On top of everything that's happened, folks, now by an incestuous relationship, both daughters are pregnant by their father. Now let me talk to you for just a moment about Lot's calamity. God sent judgment to Sodom. And the carcass of sin was now bloated. It was now ripe and, uh, for the vultures of judgment. And listen, God would have spared that city. You believe this. God is merciful. He would have spared that city if He would have found just 50 righteous people in it. But they couldn't even find 50 righteous people. Nor 40, nor 30, nor 20, nor 10 righteous people in that city. And God called Lot out of that city. And did you know that those two angels had to practically drag Lot out of that city, the Bible says. Lot was there. He was, he was looking. He's still there looking over his possessions. He's, he's still uh, counting the money in his bank account. He, he's saying, uh, bidding goodbye to all of his friends and his good buddies. And the angels had to say, Lot, hasten out of this city. God is going to destroy it. But he loved it that much. And you all remember the story. How his wife, how she looked back how she lingered. And she looked back, hating the idea of leaving. She looked back and the Bible says she turned into a pillar of salt as the fiery judgment of God fell upon her. Now she's forever embalmed in the Scriptures. Amen. Then we see Lot. He's here up in a cave now. And his two daughters who have gotten their education from the world. His two daughters who he, he wanted to be so sophisticated. His two daughters who he, he wanted to have the advantage of this world. They have become so corrupted and, uh, by the philosophies of Sodom. So depraved and so carnal in their minds that they get their father drunk. And they're hiding up there in this cave. And the first sister goes in and she lies with her father. Then the second. An incestuous relationship. And then both become pregnant. What a pitiful story. Such a terrible story. Folks, here was a man, the Bible says, that just in the beginning, he just simply pitched his tent towards Sodom. But he made that decision without God. That's a terrible thing to do, folks. Any decision that you make without God is a terrible decision. And I, I told you this earlier in the message, uh, you better not judge something by where it is, but by where it's going. I tell you what, I'd rather be in the shoes of some baby Christian who's immature but going the right way than to be in the shoes of a mature Christian who's turned away from God and is heading the wrong direction. Amen. Don't measure a thing by where it is, but by where it's going. Now I want to ask you a question this morning, all of you. Where are you headed? Where are you headed? Now I want to do something real quick. Let's just suppose that God would allow me to 
tall old lot up here at this platform today, right here beside me, to ask him some questions and to interview him. I just want to think about what it would be like real quick to do that. If I have Lot standing up here, Mr. Lot, the first question that I want to ask you, Lot, before this congregation, Lot, you lived in Sodom for 20 years. You had money. You had prestige. You had position. You had power. But Lot, here's your question. I want you to answer it honestly. Lot, were you happy? Truly happy? I mean, did you have joy down in your heart? And folks, a lot would answer you and me, and he would say this, No, I did not. I believe he would say, to be perfectly honest, Brother Russell, I was quite miserable as I lived there. You might be asking, Brother Russell, now how in the world do you know that he was miserable? Well, if you won't believe me, maybe you'll believe the Word of God. Let me give you a verse of Scripture. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 8. Check it out. The Bible says this about Lot. And that righteous man dwelling among them and seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. He was a vexed man. You know what that word vexed means? It's a word translated to mean tormented. In other words, he was tormented. He tormented his righteous soul day by day. He was a child of God, but life for him on earth was a, a living hell. And, and put it down where you can read it, the most miserable man and woman in, on the earth is not a, a lost man and woman, but the most miserable person on this earth is a saved person out of fellowship with God. Amen? Amen. The most miserable man is the child of God playing footsie with Sodom. When God saved you, folks, He didn't save you so that you couldn't sin anymore. But He fixed you so that when you did sin, you wouldn't enjoy it anymore. Amen? And a carnal Christian is not a joyful Christian. He has no joy. Listen, that righteous man, the Bible says, vexed his soul from day to day. Now, I'm going to tell you something. If you can hobnob with Sodom, and if you can live in the suburbs of sin and you can fellowship with the sodomites and the wicked things of this world and it doesn't vex or trouble your soul, then you've never been saved. You've never been saved. I'm not pointing any fingers uh, incorrectly. The Bible says that. If you're, going to, if you're a saved person, you're living that way, the Holy Spirit is going to convict you. And if you're without chastisement, you're not His Son. Now, I want to ask you another question a lot. And I want a lot of you to think about this because you may be in the same position. How much influence, Lot, did you have down there in Sodom when you lived there? Because you see, Lot, there are a lot of people in the world today who believe that in order to win the world that you have to become chummy with the world and you have to, uh, uh, to get yourself involved in what we call cocktail evangelism. In other words, we just sit around and swap dirty stories and tell dirty jokes together with them. And maybe we'll buy them a beer and, and, and drink it with them. And then a little later on, we'll invite them to church because after all, uh, they may come if they just see that we're a regular down-to-earth fellow. Now, I'm not saying that we ought to uh, point fingers at people like that and that we ought to call them names and that we ought to hate them. But folks, I'm talking about living among them and compromising with them. That's what we ought not to do. So you hear me on that. This thing that a lot of people believe that's the way though to win the world is if you just act, you'll get in there among them when the Bible says to come out and be separate from them. To be that peculiar people, then they see you. They see your good works. And then they want to glorify the Father which is in heaven. Don't argue with me in your heart today. Jesus is the one who said that. Yeah. I heard some people from a church in this area I had known them to be lost, uh, lost people, but they told me that they were going to church. They didn't tell me anything about being saved, Brother Charlie. They just said, we're going to church now. And they said, the reason we're going to church is, they said, the pastor we got, we go hunting and fishing with him, and he'd get out there and cuss right with us. And, uh, we don't feel guilty about anything we do. That makes me wonder if they never feel guilty about those things, are they truly saved? I want to tell each and every one of you something. If you ever hear me speak dirty, talk in a way that a preacher had not uh, be talking, or act a way that a preacher shouldn't be acting, call me down on it, would you please? I'm going to tell you what, I'm going to do the same thing to you. So do that for me, amen? That don't work. Lot, how much influence
influence did you have there in Sodom? I want to ask you a question. How many people did you win to the Lord while you were there? How many did you persuade to be saved while you were in Sodom? Did you win a hundred? No. Did you win fifty? No. When Abraham took his senses, he could not find fifty people that were righteous. Did you win forty lot? No. Did you win thirty? No. Did you win twenty? No. Did you win ten? Folks, he did not even win ten people to the Lord Jesus Christ. He was a complete failure. His testimony was a failure. And I want to tell you something, and you hear me on this today. When you get worldly as a Christian, when you get carnal, you may be going to heaven anyway, but there are a lot of people who are going to go to hell because of the way you live and because of your failure of a witness. Let me ask you another question a lot. You say that you were not really happy when you lived there. You say that you didn't really have any influence over the people of Sodom. Lot, what about your family? What influence did you have over your family? Now listen to me, God's people, this morning. I asked Lot that question, you can see his chin begin to quiver. You can see tears begin to fill up in his eyes, and he says, Mr. Hannah. As I look back now, as I see it from hindsight, I was a fool. I lost my children. My daughters married sodomites. And, and when I went to warn them that God was going to come to this place and He was going to destroy it with fire, they wouldn't even believe me. They laughed at me. They mocked me. They called me a religious fanatic. I lost my daughters. And even the ones that came out with me were so corrupted that horrible things happened. My life turned to a pillar of salt. I lost my family. Let me ask you one more question a lot. Surely you salvaged something when you come out of there. You, you went down there a lot, a very wealthy man. You had a lot of flocks and herds. Here's another question a lot. How much of this world's goods did you take out of there when you left? How much did you take with you? And I could hear a lot as he says, I was a fool. I lost it all. And after that, I, I was living in a cave with my two daughters without one cent to my name. Folks, you know what that's a picture of right there? Lot got out of Sodom and fire destroyed Sodom. Now the Bible says for the carnal Christian is going to face judgment one day. And you know what's going to happen? His life, his works are going to be burned up right before him. They're going to burn up like wood, hay, and stubble. But he himself shall be saved, yet so is by fire. You live a carnal life as a Christian, and everything that you live for is going to burn up right before you. You'll be saved, but with nothing to show for. Everything that he lived, dreamed for, schemed for will be gone. Lot lost it all. Now, let me tell you something. Abraham didn't lose it all. That's a different story right there. Let's think about that for just a minute. After Abraham told Lot, he said, you go east, I'll go west. You go north, I'll go south. And Lot, of course, he went east. God appeared to Abraham after that and said, Abraham, I want you to look to the east. I want you to look to the west. Abraham, I want you to look to the north. I want you to look to the south. Abraham, I'm going to give it all to you. It all belongs to you. Even that part that Lot took, Abraham, it belongs to you. Amen? Abraham, it really belongs to you. Not one stick, not one stone, not one grain of sand. Belongs to him, it all belongs to you. Folks, let me tell you something. It pays to serve Jesus Christ. Amen. It pays to serve Jesus. And Abraham is still the possessor of that land. And during the millennium, it will be Abraham's land. God gave it to him. You know, when I was a kid, Brother Kelly, we had this uh, saying, you remember, if somebody lost something uh, and somebody else found it, uh, they, they, would say, they would give it back. They'd say, finders, keepers, losers, weepers. Amen? Uh, that, that happened a lot back then. Uh, but listen, the Bible teaches something different than that. Not finders, keepers, losers, weepers. Jesus said, listen to this verse, Whosoever shall lose his life for my sake in the Gospels, the same shall find it. It's not losers. Uh, well, here's the way it goes. It's losers, keepers, and keepers, weepers. Amen? Listen, losers are the finders and the keepers are the weepers. Whosoever, Jesus said, shall lose his life for my sake in the Gospels, the same shall be saved. Oh, Abraham, he did what God wanted him to do. And God rewarded him for it. Jesus said, 
Matthew chapter 19. Everyone that hath forsaken houses or brethren or, or sisters or fathers or mothers or wife or children or lands for my name's sake, the same shall receive an hundredfold and shall inherit everlasting life. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lot, for talking with me. But there's one last thing that I want to ask you, Lot, as I close this message. Lot, what advice would you give to this congregation this morning? And Lot says there are two things that I want to tell them. First, I would remind them to watch their decisions and always involve God in their decisions because decisions determines destiny. And watch the small decisions. I would, I would tell them to not compromise with sin and to deal with sin the moment it raises its ugly head. Deal with it right then. Okay, Lot, what's the second thing that you would say to this congregation? He says, I would tell all of these Christians out there who are not walking with God, who are out of His will, to repent and get right before judgment falls. To repent and get right before judgment falls. Don't be as foolish as I was, he would tell you, and, and lose it all. Did you know that the Bible says that if we judge ourselves, we will not be judged? And that's our privilege right now to do that as we prepare for a song of invitation. Let me talk to you for just a moment. There may be somebody here this morning and you may be right smack dab in the middle of a dangerous decision that you made for your life. And your life is in turmoil right now because of it. Folks, it's not over for you. We have a loving, forgiving God. Amen? And if we'll just repent of that sin, judgment won't fall. If there would have been 50 righteous people, even 10 righteous people in that city, God would have spared that wicked city. He will forgive you of whatever condition you're in right now. Just because you made a bad decision doesn't mean that you're forever in that predicament. You call upon the name of the Lord. The Bible says that we'll confess our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen? You can get out of that predicament. Folks, the danger of that predicament that you're in right now, think about the question that I... Not only is it destroying your testimony, and did you know that the, your testimony is one of the greatest things you have in this world? You may be proud of your house and your car and your guns and all that stuff, but your testimony is one of the greatest things that you have. And if you ruin your testimony, what good are you in this world for God? Lot could not even convince his sons-in-laws and his daughters to leave that city because of the life that he's been living. Some of you, you may have family. You may have friends that you work side by side that are lost and you know they're lost. Are you being that example before them? Or are you falling right in and doing the same things that they do? You know what's going to happen if you do that? If you're engaged and you're living life just like they are, the day you do decide that you want to go and talk to them about Jesus, they're going to go, <laughs> just like they did with Lot. Who are you to tell me about getting right with the Lord? Why I live just as good as you do? Why do I need Jesus? And they'll mock you. And they won't believe you. Because your testimony will be run with them. That's why you need to get out of that decision, that, you're in, that predicament that you're in. And let me tell you, last of all, the most dangerous decision that you could ever make is if you're here and you're lost and you decide not to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. Because you know where your destiny is going to be without Jesus. It's going to be in the devil's hell. A place that wasn't even prepared for you it was prepared for the devil and his angels. But you will be cast into that place without Jesus. That's the most dangerous decision. If you have any decision you need to make today, let's all stand. And as we sing, I would pray that you would come. How the Lord is dealing with you, whether it's to be saved, maybe it's to join this church, whether it's uh, to be baptized, or whether it's just to pray for someone who needs prayer, or to rededicate your life and get out of the predicament that you're in. However God is dealing with you this morning, make a good decision, make a godly decision, and listen to the Holy Spirit and come, would you? What are we going to sing? Number 118.
Caleb Lindell uh, with us this morning. He's been visiting with us for a while now. Brother Gary and Sister Brenda's grandson. I've uh, been talking with Caleb a lot. We, we discuss the Bible a lot. We have been for a long time. But, uh, he's been coming and visiting with us for a while, and he feels that the Lord is leading him to come and join our church uh, by a letter from Foster's Chapel. Amen. About his church. Third third set. <laughs> Second. I didn't even have to ask for it. <laughs> that makes me feel good. Amen. All right, any discussion of that motion in second? Of course not. All right, all in favor? Hands down, any opposed, same sign. All right, motion carried. So we'll be sending for a letter. Now what I want you to do right now, I want to have another song, and I want us to all come around and give Caleb the, the right hand of Christian Fellowship. Even if you're not a member of this church, you can come give him the right hand of Christian Fellowship. When we get your letter, we'll give you the right hand of Church Fellowship. Amen? Let's start with this side right here, and then we'll go to this side. What are we going to say? Number 203. <laughs> story. Me and uh, I was in the laundromat this last week and Brother Boyce and Sister Martha was in there. And there was some fella in there, big tall fella, I mean big guy. He, he come walking up to us and he said, do any of y'all love the Lord? And I said, amen, they sure do. And he said, well you better get right because he's coming back in 2026. <laughs> oh really? Wow. You know, my, my Bible's always told me that no man knows the hour. Uh, not even the Son, but only the Father. And He'll tell the Son when to come. Amen? Well, at least we know He ain't coming in 2026. Exactly. Call that man be telling the truth, wouldn't he? Amen? But the, the, my point is, I don't know when He's coming, but the Bible says He's coming. Jesus said He would return. He's going to prepare a place for us. He is coming back. Amen? And when Jesus says something, you can take His word to the bank. Amen? Yeah, he'll keep His promise. 
So with that promise, we know that's a, a, a true promise. We need to get out and tell as many people as we can about the Lord. Amen. So let's remember that this next week. Any other word or announcement before this myth? Could be before 2026. Amen. Sure could. I sure ain't going to tell the Lord he can't come back over here. You know, Lot, I, I love your message this morning because Lot, he, if anybody questioned him on why he went there, he had every good reason in the world to do what he did. Right. If, as far as the world was concerned. Right. But Mama had a saying that you dabble, you get it on you. Right. There's more to it. Right. But, uh, you know, anytime we compromise, even if it's for the right reason, if God is not involved in it, there's going to be a price to be paid. So it's right. such a great lesson for all of us. I made the mistake myself. So, uh, really great message. Thank you, sir. <laughs> and and I, let me say this, folks. I hope nobody thought this morning that I was running down the people of the world, the, the, the sinners that have got God because of the things they do. Uh, they, they, we, got, we need to love them as well. And if we don't love them and carry Jesus to them, they're never going to be saved. And Jesus died for them just as much as He did us. I wasn't running them down. I'm just saying, I was, I was more or less talking to God's people. We just need to make sure that we're an example for them. We don't need to get in there and mix and mingle and live just like them, but we need to be that peculiar people that they see Jesus living in us and they want some of it. That's what I'm talking about. Amen. Amen. Anything else before we dismiss? If not, Brother Eric, would you lead us close to prayer? Lord, most gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us a chance to come together and worship in your house this morning, Lord. Thank you for the teaching and the word that we brought forth. Lord, we thank you for the time that we have been able to spend together and